Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. And this is video number two in our review and response to a book by uh, Brother Kyle Pope entitled Thinking About A.D. 70. Uh, Brother Pope has undertaken to try to respond to and to, uh, to refute the truth of covenant eschatology. And I shared with you some uh, introductory comments last week. And by the way, I, before I get into my video this morning, I want to make uh, a correction and an apology. I said last week that in the book that uh, Brother Pope did not cite my works. Well, he doesn't cite my books per se, but uh, when I stated that he did not cite my books, while that's accurate, he most assuredly did cite my YouTube videos. And I'll be really honest with you, I don't know how I overlooked the uh, footnote references to my, uh, to my YouTube videos, but I did overlook that. That was inexcusable on my part. And for that, I apologize to Brother Pope. Uh, should I should have been more careful in examining the footnotes. Uh, I, I am a person who is absolutely, I'm a stickler for footnotes and bibli bibliographic references. When I did not see any references to my books, even though Brother Pope cites what I say, it, it just went, you know, <laughs> uh, like that, that he was referencing my videos and not my books. So I do want to issue that correction and offer that apology uh, for that misstatement, for that error on my part uh, in regard to the references that, uh, that Brother Pope did make. Now then, I want to get right into his book. And uh, in chapter 2, which is entitled The Song of Moses, this is page 13 and following. And he says at the introduction, Concerning Deuteronomy 32, while this is not a passage commonly incorporated into arguments used by preterists, there are some who draw the same conclusions. Well, um, he makes mention of the fact that he has met some preterists who, quote, believe strongly that the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32 was a prophetic declaration that pointed specifically to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And then he says, while well, this is not a passage commonly incorporated by preterists, etc. Well, I'll be really honest here. I have not personally met any preterist, certainly more of the, uh, any of the, quote, leading preterists who do not appeal to Deuteronomy 32 as an eschatological prophecy of Israel's last days. I, uh, I don't know of any that do not. Perhaps there are, and so, you know, we can leave it at that, I suppose. Uh, but then, Brother Pope launches into a discussion of how the Song of Moses may actually be Exodus chapter 15, as well as, maybe, Deuteronomy chapter 32. But he seems to try to delineate between the two. Now, were the two songs of Exodus 15 and Deuteronomy 32, were they sung at different times? Well, obviously so. No one is denying that. The real question is, is Exodus 15 and Deuteronomy 32, are both of those songs eschatological, and do they both reference Israel's last days. Well, in Revelation chapter 15, John directly cites Exodus chapter 15, only this time he says that the 144,000 who are the redeemed, they are the first fruits of uh, redeemed to God from among men, Revelation 14 and verse 2, and they sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Now, it seems to me, perhaps I'm misunderstanding, I, I, I must say, I have read what Brother Pope has to say about this 
several different times, and I still find his comments to be somewhat unclear. And like I said, I, I've read the comments several times. But he seems to be delineating between Exodus 15 and Deuteronomy chapter 32. He assuredly seems to be denying that Deuteronomy 32 is actually eschatological. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but Brother Pope argues, based on his understanding of certain Hebrew terms, that Deuteronomy chapter 32 is not truly, actually speaking of Israel's last days. Rather, the Song of Moses can be seen as, may I use the term, a template. Well, I would say this, ladies and gentlemen, that's not a new idea. And that, by the way, is not a, a that's not an argument against the application of Deuteronomy 32 to A.D. 70. Now, Brother Pope makes some absolutely uh, amazing comments and admissions in his discussion of Deuteronomy chapter 32. Number one, he admits that Deuteronomy chapter 32 is, quote, the law on page chapter 15, in which he admits that Exodus 15 and Deuteronomy 32 were both songs that were sung in Israel's liturgy. And he says, either way, the people would regularly hear the entire law and 32, 1 to 43, parentheses, which was part of the law, but the wording is interesting. And, and that wording that he is talking about is when he tries to dichotomize between Deuteronomy 31 and the song and Deuteronomy 32. Well, that doesn't work, but I'm not going into that. My point here is he admits that Deuteronomy 32 is, quote, the law. Now, I want you to hang on to that. All right? Hang on to that. Because there's something else that you must understand that is absolutely critical. And before I get there, let, let me make this observation. On page 16, he shares with us a chart of one of his brethren who believes in covenant eschatology, full preterism. It's really quite a good chart, to be honest about it. The individual, this minister, has a comparative chart between the description of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and of first century Israel from Matthew to Revelation. And like I said, it, it's actually quite good. Now, it leaves out a few things that could have been put in there that are very, very significant. I'll get those as we proceed in our uh, discussion. But nonetheless, their chart is very good. Uh, among the elements in the chart is it, may, it points out that in Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 32, 21 and following, the Lord said he was going to provoke Israel to jealousy by calling the Gentiles. And the brother points out that Paul in Romans chapter 10 and 11 quotes from Deuteronomy 32 to justify his Gentile mission, calling the Gentiles. Do you catch the power of that? Deuteronomy 32 foretold the calling of the Gentiles and of God making Israel jealous of the jealous by calling the Gentiles. Paul, here's what you here's what you got to hang on to. Paul writing after the cross appeals to Deuteronomy 32 as being fulfilled in his ministry to make Israel jealous by calling the Gentiles. Now, here's why that's so critically important. Brother Kyle Pope believes, and he says so as he discusses the law in the book, 
Brother Pope believes, he teaches, he advocates, he defends the idea that the law of Moses in its entirety was nailed to the cross. Now remember, we just read his quote from page 15 where he said, Deuteronomy 32 is the law. Okay. Brother Pope says the law, meaning Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 32, passed away at the cross. But wait a minute, ladies and gentlemen. Paul, in Romans 10 and in Romans 11, tells us, quotes for us. Deuteronomy 32 and says it was being fulfilled by him in his ministry of converting the Gentiles. He says, I provoke them to jealousy, meaning he is fulfilling Deuteronomy 32. He wasn't simply using some kind of accommodative, uh, generic language. Paul said his ministry of calling the Gentiles was provoking Israel to jealousy in order that some of them might be saved, fulfilling Deuteronomy 32. Now, what does that mean? Since Paul, since Paul's ministry came years after the cross, where Brother Pope says Deuteronomy was nailed to the cross, Okay, But Paul's ministry, fulfilling Deuteronomy, i.e. the law, was years after the cross. And listen, folks, if a law or if a covenant has been abrogated, has been annulled, has been taken out of the way, it's no longer applicable. So says Kyle Pope in this book. So, Brother Pope acknowledges and agrees and teaches and admits that after a law has been abrogated and annulled and taken out of the way, it's no longer applicable. He says Deuteronomy, which is part of the law, was nailed to the cross. Yet, to reiterate this, I mean, look, I cannot emphasize this enough. Yet, he says Well, let's see, or I should say, Paul said his ministry of converting the Gentiles was the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 32, 21. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if it is the case, if it is the case that when a law or covenant has been abrogated, it is no longer applicable, then Deuteronomy 32, 21 or let me back up, and if it's true that the law, inclusive of Deuteronomy 32, was nailed to the cross, then it must be true that Deuteronomy 32, having been abrogated at the cross, was no longer applicable after the cross. However, Paul, after the cross, was applying Deuteronomy 32 to his ministry, saying his ministry was fulfilling Deuteronomy 32. Therefore, the law, inclusive of Deuteronomy 32, was not annulled, was not abrogated, was not taken out of the way, was not nailed to the cross, or else Paul was wrong. Because Paul said Deuteronomy 32 was being fulfilled in his ministry of converting the Gentiles. Now, there's a whole lot more that Brother Kyle Pope says in regard to Deuteronomy 32 that just simply is not tenable. But I want to shift gears backward for just a moment and I want to examine, as we close out this morning, Brother Pope's attempt to dichotomize between Exodus 15 and Deuteronomy 32 in regard to eschatology. 
I, I would suggest to you, and I do so as kindly and as respectfully as possible, that such a statement and such a doctrine stems from an ignorance of first century Jewish theology and Jewish practice. I have in front of me this morning the book, The Temple, Its Ministry and Services as They Were in the Time of Jesus Christ by Alfred Edersheim. Now look, Alfred Edersheim is considered one of the top, he's a little bit older, uh, dated older, but he's still accurate to a great extent, to a majority extent. He is invaluable insofar as giving us insight into the temple and its cultus, its practices in the first century. What did the Jews do in the temple of the first century? What did they believe as they practiced in the temple in the first century? Now, why do I ask those questions? Well, again, Brother Kyle Pope seeks to, to delineate between Exodus 15 and Deuteronomy 32 in regard to the song of Moses having any eschatological application. Well, let me tell you, the Jews made no such distinction. In describing the Sabbath service, now this is the Sabbath service. This is the regular Sabbath service in the temple in the time of Jesus. Now, uh, discussing what he calls the temple hymnology on page 75 and following, Alfred Edersheim talks about the singing of the priest and what have you. And he says this concerning the songs that were sung on the Sabbath. And let me back up here to the appropriate place. And he said, there is a third reference in the book of Revelation to the harps of God, the hymnody, hymnolo, hymnology of the temple, excuse me. There is yet a third reference in the book of Revelation to the harps of God with most pointed allusion, not to the ordinary, but to the Sabbath services in the temple. In this case, the harpers are all they who had gotten victory over the beast. Listen carefully. The church which has come out of great tribulation stands victorious on the sea of glass. And the saints, having the harps of God, sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. This is the Sabbath of the church. See, he's commenting on Revelation chapter 15. It is the Sabbath of the church. And as on the Sabbath, beside the psalm, for the day, which was Psalm, uh, let me see, uh, 92. It is the Sabbath of the church, and as on the Sabbath, beside the psalm for the day at the ordinary sacrifice, they sung at the additional sa sabbatic sacrifice in the morning the song of Moses, Deuteronomy 32, and in the evening that in Exodus 15, so the victorious church, in Revelation in other words, celebrates her true Sabbath rest by singing the song of Moses and of the Lamb, only in language that expresses the fullest meaning of the Sabbath songs in the temple. So, Edersheim is sharing with us that on the Sabbath they sung Deuteronomy 32 and they sung Exodus chapter 15. Why? They did because Paul explains that for us in Colossians chapter 2, 14 to 16, where Paul says, Let no man judge you in respect of new moons, of feast days, and of Sabbaths, which are, that's in the present tense of the Greek, that means they are, from Paul's perspective in A.D. 62, they are shadows of the good things that are, quote, about to come, the literal rendering. So when Paul wrote in A.D. 62, every Sabbath, every Sabbath, 
in the sabbatic services, they sang Deuteronomy 32 and Exodus 15 as they looked forward to the type of and to typical fulfillment of what those songs looked forward to. What did those songs look forward to? The true Sabbath of salvation. The true Sabbath of the resurrection. After all, that's what the 144,000 are doing. Looking for the final rest. The final salvation rest. So you see, in the mind of the first century Jews, there was no dichotomy in regard to what those songs of Moses pointed forward to. They both pointed forward to the ultimate soteriological salvation. That's what soteriological means. Soteriological fulfillment of both songs. They pointed forward to the resurrection. They pointed forward to the coming of the Lord. They pointed forward to the judgment. And every Sabbath, the Jews sung both songs anticipating the same thing. And so let me say again, when Brother Pope seems to be trying to draw a distinction between Exodus 15 and Deuteronomy 32 in regard to eschatology, he is failing to understand how the Jews saw those songs as looking forward to the same event. And thus, when we come to the book of Revelation, when we find reference to Exodus 15, we are implicitly hearing the echo of Deuteronomy 32. And then, then in Revelation 19, we will hear the direct citation of Deuteronomy 32. So, what we have seen this morning is that Brother Pope makes some amazing, and I would suggest to you, fatal admissions. He says the Song of Moses was part of the law. He says if a law has been abrogated, annulled, taken out of the way, it's no longer applicable. And yet we have seen, and by the way, we're not through, okay, there's more. We have seen that Paul, in his personal ministry, applied Deuteronomy 32, 21. Number one, he used it as justification for his ministry. Number two, he said it was being fulfilled in his ministry, and yet he was writing in 57, 58, 59 A.D., which means that Deuteronomy 32 had not been annulled, had not been abrogated, had not been taken out of the way, had not been nailed to the cross. If Deuteronomy 32 was being fulfilled in Paul's ministry, then let me kindly and respectfully say, Brother Kyle Pope's entire discussion of Deuteronomy 32 and eschatology is falsified. And I'll have a whole lot more to say about Deuteronomy 32 and Brother Pope's comments about it and his attempts to escape it next week. Listen, you have a fantastic weekend. I'll see you on Monday.